Hello. Uh, welcome to Roll Call. My name is Kayla McNabb, and uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'll be your host this evening. Uh, I'm here with our game master and some of our players from our uh, Nightfall game from earlier this month uh, on April 9th. So if you saw that and you have questions for them, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the session and about the work of literature and just kind of learning more about uh, how that went, things that we thought, um, whatnot. So I will start with our game master. Uh, if you could just remind us of your name, your pronouns, and uh, your job at Tech. Sure. Uh, I'm Anthony Wright Day Hernandez. I use he and they pronouns. Uh, people on Twitch may know me as Rogan27. Um, I am the Community Collections Archivist at Virginia Tech. I work in Special Collections and University Archives, primarily with um, any material that we have related to historically marginalized communities. Awesome. And then we have uh, several folks joining us from North Carolina State University Libraries, right? I was very worried about <laughs> that. Uh, so <laughs> we'll go around in the order that you appear on uh, Twitch. So, uh, Laura, if you could go first, um, let us know a little bit about yourself, your role in the libraries there, um, and remind us of your character um, and both your and their pronouns. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Fontaine. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the Student Success and Engagement Librarian at NC State. And uh, my work there involves um, introducing undergraduates to the libraries, creating different engaging experiences for them, and connecting with different um, student departments and groups on campus. Uh, my character for this game was Shireen96. She uses she, her pronouns. Um, she is a chaotic explorer who plays too many games. Um, and my inspiration for her character was uh, Jessica Jones. Um, I kind of mm. pictured her as this um, kind of like private, private investigator, um, a little badass and like didn't take any crap. Um, she, her background was that she had dropped out of Cerro University where she was going, where she was majoring in criminal justice. Um, and she dropped out to become her own private investigator. And yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was some of the stuff that we didn't really get to get into, but that was her in my mind. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And mm -hmm. uh, thank you for being here. And I'll continue kind of around the circle. Uh, Sean would be up next. Hi everyone, I'm Sean Bennett. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the research librarian for business, education, and data literacy at the NC State Libraries, uh, which basically just means I'm the research and instruction librarian for business and education. Uh, I played Elsid23, who was a clever warrior who moved like a cat. Uh, I did not have a very involved backstory, I'm ashamed to say, but he was basically a tough for the university researchers and kept them safe, mostly from wildlife, until things went pear-shaped. Excellent, thank you. All right, and last but not least, uh, Malaka. Oh, it's Malika. <laughs> Malika. Malika. No I'm so sorry. Um, my Thank name you. is Malika Friedman. I use she, her pronouns. I am the graduate extension assistant for the Hill Library Makerspace, and I am also a PhD candidate in the Communication, Rhetoric, and Digital Media program. Very long to say. <laughs> Basically, in the <laughs> libraries, what I do is I work with uh, doing a lot of course collaborations, helping courses get exposed to Makerspace, while also leading Makerspace workshops with printing, uh, sewing machines, and embroidery. Uh, things of that nature. So all, all the fun make uh, The character I ended up playing was 28, uh, also using her pronoun, and they were uh, an empathetic um, academic advisor at uh, the university who was very much into, through the system, let me hack the system for the students that needed it. So that was kind of her whole background was just let's just go ahead and get you through the class. And so I was aware of the people in my group in a different level. Um. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, yes, and she is not with us tonight, uh, but I'm sure she'll be here in spirit. Um, so, awesome. Thank you all for, uh, it's, it's always 
interesting, especially when we don't get into very much of the background in the game to see kind of how much some folks think through a lot of aspects of the background of a character for a one shot. And some folks kind of have more of a rough picture that they're kind of filling things in on as they go. So that's always really interesting. Um, so I guess since this is a work that was less familiar maybe to many folks in our audience, uh, Anthony, would you mind telling us a little bit about the work kind of in general and kind of maybe putting it in context a little sure. bit? Sure. So the the book itself, which I have here, <laughs> uh, the book by Asimov and Silverberg was actually written in 1990 um, or came out in 1990. It's based on a short story that Asimov had published in Astounding Science Fiction in September 1941 um, that has been cited wow. in numerous polls and amongst the science fiction, speculative fiction community as one of the best science fiction or sorry, speculative fiction uh, short stories ever written. It is an iconic piece of fiction and it actually, that short story almost in its entirety appears in the novel um, it's kind of the center section, uh, so it actually covers some events that happened before where we pick up the one shot. Um, but essentially, um, it takes place on an alien world. Um, there's a little introduction in the book about... Uh, it struck me as interesting. Uh, they talk about how we're going to talk about cars, and we're going to talk about mugs, and we're going to talk about uh, buildings, and it's important to remember that this is an alien planet and that's not what they actually call these things. But rather than call them by strange, unusual names that will mean nothing to you, we're going to call them by the equivalent term that it's, so it's this introduction to how to read science fiction um, that I've never encountered anywhere else. And I'm not sure why mm -hmm. it was felt necessary to put that in a novel in 1990, but I actually really enjoy that introduction. Yeah. But that's that's beside the story. Um, the story, I I won't give everything away, but essentially it's divided into three sections. The first section is um, kind of laying out the world, uh, introducing you to some of the main characters, and um, just familiarizing yourself with a little bit of the history, giving the laying down the clues. Mm -hmm for what's going to happen. Um, that section of the book is new. That's None of that is in the short story. It's referred to in the short story and then fleshed out in the novel. The second section is actual, like, nightfall. So this takes place on a planet that has six suns um, and only has darkness once every 2,049 years. Um, because there's essentially a planet-sized moon that orbits the planet and eclipses one of the six suns once every 2,049 years. Um, <clears throat> and so the second section is essentially the short story where the eclipse mm -hmm. is actually happening and um, kind of the drama leading up to them seeing for the first time a night sky filled with stars and um in the, this place with the six suns uh the planet has been located by the authors in the middle of a stellar nursery so when when the night sky actually appears it's more like what's behind me than what you see in the um in the sky above when you look out at night there are like 10 times the number of stars visible to them than are visible from earth and so they go from knowing about six suns and thinking that that's basically the entirety of the universe to this revelation of their insignificance. Um, and so then the third section, like th that's where the short story ends, is the stars mm. appear in the sky and that's the end. Um, the third section, which is the section that I kind of decided to bring all of you through as the adventure for the, the one shot, is the aftermath. Um, the survivors who make it through the eclipse and um, have to try and survive in a world where some people have broken from reality entirely and 
others are trying to connect with people to, to try and salvage whatever remains. Yeah, I literally have goosebumps thinking about like a moment being such a pivot, right? And like your understanding of your place in the universe is a huge thing conceptually. Um, that's fascinating. Yeah, it definitely makes me want to read. I want to know what happens because we didn't we touched on, like you said, that that aftermath more so than anything else. Uh, in the in the one shot and it was fascinating <laughs> many interesting things happened uh, <laughs> and I think uh, we definitely we definitely wanted to get into some of that um, but before we get into any other questions I wanted to offer the um, the kind of floor to anyone else does anyone have a question that they would like to ask either each other or um, or the game master um, about the game or about your experience with the game? It's okay if the answer is no. I think I've got one. Awesome. So were there any um, any points where we deviated severely from what you expected? Mm -hmm. Or maybe a better way of putting it is, were there any points where we didn't? And you were like, okay, good. They didn't choose the thing that I haven't prepared for. I'm always curious about that with the DMs. Like, how much do you actually prepare and how much do you just let the wrecking ball that is the the players run away down the highway. Um, I had a general goal that I needed to get you onto, which was essentially you need to head for the park. I really was not prepared for you to go elsewhere. I had, you know, in, in my mind, I, I could have adapted. Um, the things that I had prepared for that journey to have you encounter that uh, on a journey to anywhere else that you might choose to go. And it, it would have taken a little bit of dancing on my part, but um, it wouldn't have severely hindered what I had in mind. The um, thing I was not really prepared for was the bulldozer. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but it came up and I was like, yeah, it makes absolutely perfect sense. And so I went with it and um, let you guys lead the way. And for a moment, I thought that that was going to eliminate one of the early encounters that I had prepared, which was the dogs. But then you decided to stop and get liquor at a liquor store downtown or at a, a bar downtown. And I was like, hey, those dogs are going to show up because <laughs> they were attracted by the noise. And and so I was still able to get like that early encounter in there, um, which I didn't expect to be resolved quite as quickly as you did. But um, what you did to take care of chasing off the dogs made perfect sense, and you rolled well. So you took you took you got rid of the dogs really quickly, <laughs> which was fine. <laughs> there was plenty of other content. I don't think I'll ever have another session, probably, where we where the party takes such an enormously brash approach in the loudest possible way to get to the next destination. We couldn't have found a louder conveyance if we tried. <laughs> I loved when you all decided to um, run the bulldozer through the burning building <laughs> and just, like, <laughs> my bulldozer, because I knew that the next thing you were going to encounter was the the highway that was full of all of the wrecked vehicles and that bulldozer would have just cleared the way but you decided to burn the bulldozer and I just was so happy with that <laughs> ah, inadvertently helping the DM <laughs> oh my gosh um, I have a question so was the house full of cannibals part of the original plan it was and that okay. um that was an adaptation of uh, an encounter that happens in the book. So essentially, um, I took you through a lot of that third section. It's not exactly identical, and um, it, but different characters in the novel actually do encounter things. And so um, there's a relatively unscathed neighborhood, at least from like the street side view. Um, and one of the characters comes across a group of people who 
are not fond of uh, the academics from the university who brought down destruction upon the world um, as as these people believe um, and he's a in the in the book that character is a little bit overweight and the people he encounters attack him for being from the university but then mm. also decide to eat so it's <laughs> So I put you up against a group of cannibals that didn't like university people because that was one of the encounters that happens in the book, although not in the way that it happened here. Weren't set on fire? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that one of my favorite parts was Jonathan's role-playing of the character throughout that scene was just... <laughs> unbelievably good. I hope I never forget the mental image of an alien ac academic yelling you haven't filled out the IRB as they're dragged into a house of cannibals. I just hope that never leaves my mind. <laughs> I will always think of that when I am forced to fill out the IRB applications from now on. Like, no matter what, you've got to get the consent. <laughs> yep. It's very important. Yep. Were there... No exceptions. Uh, were there any encounters that we ended up missing? Like, I had a feeling that there was the um, army that that was the only. Um, so potentially, um, but I had it set up so that I could sort of adjust the resolution for time. Um, and so there there were a couple of districts that I had prepared for along the highway if you happened to get through the early ones faster or avoided the cannibals somehow or like um, I had additional like districts along the highway that I could have inserted if I needed to fill more time um, and given time yes it's possible that you would have had an interface and an encounter with the um, the apostles of flame, which is the the cult army that was headed out to the park. Um, <clears throat> I'm kind of glad that that didn't come up because the resolution that you all had of getting to the park and kind of giving them advanced warning is not the same as what happens in the book, and so I'm very glad um, that. Essentially, this doesn't spoil the very end of the book for you all. Um, and in fact, I'm not going to talk about how the book ends with regard to resolution ah. between the uh, academics at Mgondo and the Apostles of Flame. Um, I think it's done really nicely mm -hmm. in the book and I really enjoy the ending of it. Um, the One of the themes which really comes through in the book for me is this idea of um, preservation of knowledge and the distortion of it over time, um, particularly looking at religion and this like idea of a holy text that is carrying important knowledge forward but has shifted it and twisted it, it over time so that um, it's not exactly what was intended at the start. And so you're, the cyclic nature of this civilization uh, they've tried recording the events of the eclipse multiple times throughout history, and it carries through as religious dogma rather than objective fact. Hmm. Um, and to me, that's just really interesting. That's like those... Th that time scale is fascinating, too, right? A 2,049-year mm -hmm. cycle is long enough that it seems fathomable, but so long that it would be really easy to misinterpret telephone-wise yeah. from one generation to the next. I'm sorry, Sean. No, it, it reminds me a little bit of those discussions around how to mark uh, nuclear waste sites for the next several millennia. And they have, actually, I think in the makerspace at State, um, a student printed out a whole bunch of examples of what they might look like, like huge pillared spikes sticking out of the ground, very ominous architecture designed to ward off someone who would not have any 
any cultural touchstones we'd be familiar with, any language we know, just something that makes it look scary and intimidating. Yeah. There is an episode of 99% Invisible uh, on this topic, uh, and that is a unique challenge when you don't have shared cultural like touch points. Um, because they, someone might see that and think, pointy rocks, that's really yeah. cool. I want to see what's where those pointy rocks are. Yeah, and there was they were they were discussing that in this thing that I read. Like, there was they were gonna put a big plaque up. It said in every language possible, like, this is not a place of honor. There is no treasure buried here. There are no wonders. But that's not really a fail safe though. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's also what someone would say if there were <laughs> right. Like, <there's, laughs> like just knowing how mankind works, they'd be like, no, there's there's totally shinies in there. <laughs> Yeah, we want to keep the shinies for ourselves, so we're going to say there are no shinies here. Yeah. Um, interesting. Um, that actually, that makes me think a little bit about, about one of the topics that we generally try to touch on in Roll Call, and that is in kind of other places where some of these themes and some of the like components of this work have found their way into popular culture. Um, and I don't know, I guess... To start with, has anyone else here read the the book or the short story that it was based on? And then are there other places where you've seen this in popular culture? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, no. thankfully, none of you New. have encountered the one place I know of that it definitely showed up in popular culture, which is a 1988 film called Nightfall. That is apparently one of the worst films ever made. Oh, no, I need <laughs> oh. to see this. It's it's a film based on this novel and or based on the short story, and it is apparently very 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 bad. I've not seen it myself, um, but yeah. Mm. There's it's the reading of it. There is a comment in the chat on Twitch that the movie Pitch Black seems inspired by this, at least interesting idea i mean given how iconic the short story is supposed to be within the speculative fiction realm i'm sure it has had influence on um other works kind of just the the general idea of exploring a theme as big as um kind of religious dogma through the course of of this or um just the conception of what other worlds would be like. Uh, one thing that it draws to mind for me is like um, Shishin Liu's uh, three body problem. Um, mm. Just just from the orbital mechanics exploration of six suns with a planet and a moon, and the amount of work that had to go into figuring out how such a system would work. Um. Yeah. Oh, geez. Kira linked the IMDb for the 1988 Nightfall movie. <laughs> I was about to say you should look at the Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. Twitter. So if you're, it says that. Uh, yeah. If you're interested, it's in the chat. Don't put, do not Two... ever rent this. <laughs> <laughs> Two point six out of ten. I mean, now I have to watch it. <laughs> oh wow. It'd be a fun oh, thing for my wife. Fun. Jess, I found the perfect movie for us for tonight. I can just blame y'all. <laughs> I'm going to introduce my co-streamer. This is Atticus, who, who oh. has just woken up from his Hello last nap. Hello and welcome. Can you wave to everybody? Seems incredulous. Can you wave? He might be too tired to wave. <laughs> it's okay. He's like, I just heard you talking about an awful movie. There we go. There's, there's the wave. We had, oh, we got we a had wave. one little wave. So I'm not familiar with Pitch Black, but um, <laughs> the comment in there in the chat is, uh, in that movie, the characters crash land on a planet that only has darkness every few decades. Mm. Ah, yes. The, the, the main issue there is that there are monsters in the dark. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> and now Kira's uh, going to make sure that I see Pitch Black. <laughs> I had not seen Pitch Black and um, our uh, colleague and my husband Jonathan uh, 
required that it be watched. And it was not a bad film. So, more than a 2.6 <laughs> out of 10, for sure. It also does have sequels, that's true. And a short animated film. Um, <laughs> wow. So if you want to get really into pitch black lore, uh, there are multiple facets. Oh, uh, according to sure. Wikipedia, uh, the adaptations in other media section. Uh, in the 1950s, the story was adapted for radio programs Dimension X and X-1. Oh. In 1976, um, Analog Records as their only release presented a further dramatization of Nightfall on a 33 and a third RPM vinyl record. Oh. Um, Dawn is a 1981 novel written by Dean McLaughlin as a reimagining of the story. Uh, hmm. It mentions the very bad movie. <laughs> Apparently another film version also titled Nightfall was made in 2000. Um, and then oh. in April 2007, it was the the story was used for the hundredth episode of Escape Pod, a science fiction podcast. Huh. Less places than I would expect for a story that is acclaimed as being a very influential and popular story. Yeah, I wonder if this is mostly places that explicitly said, but it's actually gotten into the the zeitgeist. Uh, in a way that folks don't necessarily immediately think that this was really the the kernel that they built their idea on. <laughs> There's also the suggestion that the Wikipedia article be updated to include uh, the <laughs> Roll Call <laughs> podcast and the role of play also. Uh, so... If anyone's really into editing some Wikipedia, there is some fresh information that could be added to that Wikipedia this is page. True. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I think some pieces of that get to uh, to one of the questions that we we often discuss about unique challenges in adapting this work in particular to a tabletop RPG. Was there anything that you thought was particularly challenging as you tried to decide? what part of this huge story it seems like you were going to focus uh, on. The hard part for me was I love the entire story and I want to share the entire thing and I had to pick part of it. And um, so that was, that was the difficulty. The story itself, the third act, especially the third section of the story is a journey. And a journey translates really well to a role-playing game. Um, so that seemed like the natural fit for what to do. Um, and it, it takes out all the exposition part and the actual like climax, which is Nightfall itself. Um, I, and I set you after that, which doesn't ruin those for somebody who reads the book later. Um, and so just focusing the RPG on the journey seemed seemed like the natural fit for this. Yeah, and that might be a good transition into talking a little bit about the system. So this is the first time they were using this system, and it was selected specifically for this work. What kind of invited you to make that that choice? Sure. So, um, I mean, the most well-known system out there is Dungeons and Dragons, and there are sci-fi adaptations for that. There are things you can do to adapt it to a more modern world, but it really, at its core, is built around the fantasy genre, and so I didn't feel like it was the best fit for this. Um, the cipher system... Uh, which is published by Monty Cook Games, it is a very versatile system. It is meant to be as bare bones as possible and give you mechanics that will work and translate into any story, any genre that you want to do. Um, and one of the areas that it does really well is science fiction, but it also has like a modern 
setting. It has rules and, and resources for building out a modern setting. And while this is at its core a speculative fiction, science fiction story, the technology level involved is basically equivalent to a couple decades ago for us. Like, it is we living today on Earth are more technologically advanced than the alien society that's depicted in this story. So having the tool sets available um, to be able to draw in uh, stats for realistic creatures that you would encounter in a modern day society like feral dogs, um, being able to pull in the idea of like a pistol or a car or something like that, but also <clears throat> have the opportunity to pull in something a little bit more fantastical if necessary, um, really made this feel like a good fit. So plus cipher system is good for an early GM like me <laughs> um, because <laughs> it has good tools for how, here's how you can set difficulty difficulty is there's like a chart of uh how difficult would it be for somebody to actually accomplish doing this you find that descriptor it gives you a target number um and then the D the gm doesn't roll dice at all that's the players the players do all of mm -hmm. that the players have the opportunity to take their resources pool pool them together and figure out how to overcome an obstacle instead of um Instead of just roll the dice and it's either good or not, um, there's a little bit more flexibility for that. And um, I, I like that a little bit. So <laughs> um, I know sometimes you want hard, fast, yes, no. Uh, but for, for this, for the one shot, for the collective storytelling that we were doing, um, I liked kind of the malleability of... Uh, figuring out what can you add to this to lower the difficulty to make it more possible to achieve that aspect of strategy was really interesting to see play out as it was also an, a new system for me to watch folks play um and for our players what systems are you familiar with uh was this your first time playing using the cipher system and kind of any thoughts you have on that uh, how it compares yeah. Anyone wants to jump in? I'll I'll jump in. Um so I'm used to playing Dungeons and Dragons. That's the only system I've played. So this was my first time delving into a new one um and into the cipher system. And um it was really interesting. So I think personally as a player, I think I and it's probably a, like just because of comfort. Like I think I prefer Dungeons and Dragons because I also like the fantasy element. Like that's what I love about role playing games. Um, and then I also, we didn't get to do this. I don't think we did this as much. And so I don't, I'm not really sure like what the mechanics are for Cypher. Um, but I've realized that I really like fighting <laughs> in these games. So like, I love the D and D like fighting and, and stuff like that. Um, and I know there's fighting in Cypher and we fought off some dogs and stuff, but, um, but yeah, I think, um. It was really interesting, but it was pretty easy to pick up, which I really like. Like, there weren't very many elements. Like, D&D &D can get really confusing. And, I mean, there's still elements that I'm not super clear on. Sorry, my cat just decided to come visit me because he hears me talking. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I've lost my train of thought now. But that, that was basically it. Um, it was very interesting and really cool to try out. And I definitely can see how it's much more flexible than D&D &D and allows you to do cool things. Um, and to like focus on story, which that too is another part I enjoy. So, um, yeah, so I just rambled. <laughs> no, that's great. Is fifth edition what you're most familiar with or were you? Yeah, I had a brief yeah. introduction to 3.5 and then that didn't really like draw me in. And then five came out and I got introduced to it again. And I was like, this is fun. I started with 3.5 and it's has too many similarities to Excel spreadsheets, frankly. <laughs> it's, it's 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 very complete. It's you know it's got a lot of math, a lot of complexity. But um, for myself, I think I prefer fifth as well, just because I can step away from it for a year, come back, and not feel like I need to take 
a class. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also done Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition. Um, it's kind of what I was introduced with that. I also do. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> you said Excel sheet. Uh, one of my friends is currently having me and a few other people play test an RPG system that synthesizes uh -huh. like five or seven different kinds. So there's a lot of math and it involves rolling a D100. So, so a golf ball? Like <laughs> Oh, it's it's something and then you have to like account for all these different things. So seeing Cypher in comparison to that, I was like, okay. <laughs> I feel like I kind of have like an idea of what's going to maybe happen. I think I just need to literally because I know what I did. I set aside like hours different parts of the to understand. Yeah, Cypher wasn't too bad to get into. You know, whenever you're approaching a new RPG system, there's always that trepidation about, okay, how much how much learning am I going to have to really sit down and do, you know, how much coursework? Um, a friend of mine invited me to play <laughs> Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and I haven't gotten very deep into it because it's a little bit more impenetrable than Cypher was. Yeah, it, it does seem fairly inviting as someone who has not read the material, but as a, as a watcher, as a viewer, uh, it does seem uh, more accessible. Uh, but I'm also coming from the perspective of someone who started playing Dungeons and Dragons 2nd Edition, um, and Thacos were a yeah. thing. There was all, there's, we've come a long way. <laughs> Um, but we so. didn't get into like the full depth of Cypher. We didn't do a whole lot with the Cyphers themselves. You had them, but didn't end up using them a whole lot, which isn't really surprising for a one-shot. Um, and, and there are certain things like the um, XP spend for rerolls um, mm -hmm. that I've seen done the way it's written, which basically can just drag out the rolling forever because you can just keep spending if, it, if people have more XP, you can just keep spending XP to try again um, which is why I put in the rule um, that I would let you keep using XP but it was exponentially more cost each time, so the first reroll was 1, the second reroll would be 2, the third was 4, the fourth was 8, etc. Um just to kind of encourage moving on from that. Um, and then the other thing that XP is good for is leveling up, um, which eventually the characters do level and that system is a little bit um, confusing for somebody who's used to the way that leveling works in, in Dungeons and Dragons because mm. um, really in Cypher there are you, you start at tier one and you are a like god class character at tier five um and so you're not going to level nearly as often um the the goal of cypher is not go fight the thing to earn the xp to level up it's meant to encourage you to explore more of like the storytelling and the role-playing aspects of a ttrpg um fighting can still happen and does but um, it's less of a focus than in Dungeons and Dragons I think I could see Cypher being very very um, maybe more than the others dependent on the GM's like willingness to tell a story and flexibility and so I think in that regard you did a, a remarkable job because at no point did I ever feel like you had anything but complete control and knew exactly what was going on um, and I so you know absolute props to you for, for, for doing that you said you, you hadn't done this before or had you, had you used this, Cypher in the past? This is the first Cypher system that I ran it's the third session ever that I ran the first that's amazing the first was a 5e session the second was 5e using spy game uh, and this yep. was the third this was supposed to be the fourth but the lasers and feelings session i was supposed to run got uh canceled Thought you <laughs> i literally was like oh yeah you, you like you super like tolerating questions as well <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I was certain this was like, oh, he's must be, he's been doing this for years. Wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you exude uh, confidence in the 
game master chair. So it's well done, and it was very enjoyable to watch uh, as a viewer for sure. Um, I was up here laughing out loud uh, <laughs> at several moments, and I was like, I hope it's not loud enough that it's getting. <laughs> there was a up bit of zaniness on Jonathan's mic downstairs. There was a bit of zaniness. <laughs> yes. Just hope none of my colleagues in the libraries ask, well, what exactly did you all do? What decisions did you make? Well, <laughs> there was some fire and some liquor and the bulldozer. It's fine. I know. I was hesitant at first because I was like, okay, like this is, I'm here representing the libraries. I want to play this game and be like, you know, and, but then I got into it and I was like, I'm just going to play it how I play and like, MO, find some alcohol. <laughs> Second, MO, burn stuff down. Which, <laughs> like, I just. already burned to the ground, so that was not <laughs> a bad approach. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I just, for me, like, role playing games, I just do, like, I get to be, like, the exact opposite of, like, what I would actually be like, or just do crazy things that I wouldn't do in real life. Um, and I just think it's so fun. I, I also love to derail. <laughs> You did it so, well. so I had a lot of fun with the used car salesman at the end, which oh, yeah. was totally unplanned. I was just like, hmm, we're basically at time. I can have this be an open road for them, but how do I speed them along? And I was just like, hey, there's a used car salesman here. Because you were asking, I think you were asking about um, stuff like that, the status of the road and the... Yeah, yeah we were so faster. determined to drive to where we were going <laughs> and use a car. So I gave it to you, but I made you work for that car purchase. You had to give up a lot <laughs> of your alcohol. And then I... And my chainsaw, <laughs> which I'm so a little bummed about. <laughs> and then I decided to make it like a, a jet car, like a flying car thing with the propellers and what... And that was just me adding like a little bit of like spec fiction flavor to it because that no, was great that was like the book just calls them cars so it doesn't describe them at all so i was like i can have it be any kind of car i want the book actually has needle guns instead of like pistols but i didn't remember that when i was uh helping you all with your character sheets so you put up um, a needle gun? yeah and they would have functioned basically the same but <clears throat> i just by the time I remembered that they were needle guns in the book, you all already had your character sheets set, and I didn't want to change anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was another one of my favorite parts, actually, just because I forget who brought it up. It might have been Jonathan. We were asking all these sort of pointed questions about how alone we were with this poor car salesman. <laughs> <laughs> and very obviously going towards the murder hobo approach like, to this problem. You're in the middle of a, a big group of people. <laughs> like, you cannot murder your way out of this. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. That's always an option, though. <laughs> it's funny, Laura, you say that, like, with the way you approach role playing games. I find myself, I, I have a very hard time, like, being wicked in RPGs in general. Like, I can't... I feel bad about it later, which is ridiculous. <laughs> so I'm always playing, like, paladins and clerics. And <laughs> Gotta play Rogue more often. I, I should. I need to. <laughs> but I always feel bad about it. I'm like, was the person I stole from wicked? No? Oh. So how did you feel that your characters translated as far as character class between this and uh, 5e, what would you consider your 5e character mm. class to be for, for who you played? I think, so the way I was thinking about her in my mind, I was definitely thinking rogue. Um, so I think she was, would be like a rogue. <laughs> and you were... Um, I'm... Shireen 96. Yeah, but you were an explorer. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, and that that makes sense. You were an explorer with stealth flavor, so absolutely, that that feels very much roguey. I feel like I was kind of going for like an artificial uh, artificer kind of mm -hmm. vibe because I think I just ended up with a uh, speaker. Mm -hmm. Technically, speaker I I... is is very much a social combat class, um, and that fit really well with your backstory. I think I was pretty much a fighter <laughs> with like a little bit of uh, a tinker concepts on the side. Um, 
because I, I still wasn't super confident in how well I knew the system, so I figured, okay, you know, the, the guy who hits things and shoots things, that should be relatively straightforward. Yeah, and, and your type was warrior, and you had the technology flavor. Um, yep. But yeah, that would that would translate directly to, like, a fighter. Uh, the The speaker... I'm not sure exactly where speaker would naturally fit, uh, translating to... Mm. Bard? Potentially like a bard or something like that would make sense. Um, really, uh, yeah, I think that's the only one that really comes to mind. And then um, the other one that we had was an explorer with scholar flavor. Um, Monk? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's a different system, so it doesn't translate exactly. Um, <laughs> But there's really only like the four types uh, in in Cypher, the um, Explorer, Speaker, Warrior, and my brain will not give me the other one at the moment, but it's um, more of a like mystic magic user-y type, uh, which wouldn't have fit yeah. in our setting. I see uh, Lena is defending herself. <laughs> yeah, in the chat. The murder. Lena was built to run away from The this. murder was inferred. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe I, I inferred that. Murder is always implied. Yeah. Yeah. Something um, that I found, like, that was interesting that came up after um, the game when we were chatting after like it wrapped up was since I, I hadn't read the book and so I had no clue what the story was or what was happening going into it other than the description and so there was one point where Lena was trying to convince us that like the dark was her, like her theory was always that the night was a living thing and living creature. Yes. And so I thought like, I was like, Oh, I think that is that what happens? That's probably what happens in nightfall. I bet you the night is a living creature. And then, um, and then Anthony was asking us like, how convinced would you be that about this? And I was like, I think I'd be pretty convinced. I made you all yeah. Roll that sounds for legit it. to me. Yeah. I, I made, <laughs> yeah. uh, I made, uh, I made Jonathan roll for how convincing their argument was, or yeah, but... and it was it was very high. So I mean, it was a convincing yeah. argument, and 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 you timed the ending of it very well. But had we unlimited time and, and didn't get tired, I was gonna have a lot of fun with like telling every single person we met that shadows are real, man, <laughs> and they're gonna get you. <laughs> we'll start writing pamphlets for people. <laughs> for, yes. uh like, I think that really fit really well with the theme of the book and the whole idea that the people coming out, the survivors, are the ones who carry the history forward and that became the religious dogma. Uh, so in the book, the religious description for the eclipse is that the planet enters a giant cave that swallows up the suns and then the stars the stars are like um or sorry they they enter a giant cave the suns disappear and it um essentially eats people's souls uh and it okay. so it's it's a religious description of an eclipse that causes people to break from reality um <laughs> and the idea of the stars raining fire upon the earth was also it, it's the stars that were really really causing people to to not be able to cope and to um lose track of themselves mentally and their response to it they had already been setting fires because of the darkness that was being caused by the start of the eclipse that once all these lights appeared in the sky once the stars appeared they just keep going and burn everything down and are on a rampage of destruction um, while they are disconnected from reality. And so the idea that you all came through this and had this idea that the dark was a living creature that was swallowing up the, the light, um, that fit really well with the theme of the work itself. And I, I really enjoyed that. 
I see Lena is is expanding the theory in the chat, uh, and mm. I I can just imagine the final paper that would come out of that with the <laughs> citation at the bottom, as my good friend Bob twenty three the used car salesman told me. <laughs> Did Lena have him find an iron though? I don't and she remember. Used data. <laughs> was I think so, actually. I remember an IRB came out at some point and was mm -hmm. signed. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you could potentially use it as existing data, but it would have to be completely anonymized. Um, <laughs> Librarian jokes, depends folks. Depends on your board. Yeah. <laughs> now I have to find... I did just recently have to go through our IRB training again, uh earlier this week so maybe i'm a little salty i'm not to find out if, if state's irb director has ever played D, &D or role playing because she seems like she might be the type and then uh, i will share the story with her because that would be amazing i would probably wager i guess that she has i met her in person she's just still late she's she is she's amazing and i just have this funny feeling she seems like the kind of person who would get a kick out of that so maybe next time i'll, I'll share that with her just let it be like what is the irb for D D? and also do you play rpgs and also, and also cannibals <laughs> well and the video of the uh session is actually available on our youtube channel so. maybe i'll pass that to her then <laughs> yeah oh all of our sessions and all of our, our roll call sessions um, and archival adventures are available VOD after after our live streams on our YouTube channel um, and here for a while the policy on that is not as fleshed out so, but they do go to YouTube yeah, Twitch to live. Yeah, keep them for two weeks um, and then oh, yeah. we, we can highlight them, them and make them stay while. longer but yeah. it's unclear exactly how long they'll last um, and eventually we, we get them over to YouTube. So um. I didn't know that. I, I thought they were indefinite on Twitch. That's good to know. Yes. So Kira has shared the uh, VA Tech Libraries uh, YouTube channel. So yeah, you can check out our VODs there. Um, All right, let's see here. What else do we have? Does anyone else have questions for each other to touch on before we look back at our list? I'm curious how close the other players were to saying, heck with it, we're going to fight our way out of the fire brigade and possibly have us all killed in the first 10 minutes of the scene. <laughs> oh, that was an interesting opening, and, and we should talk about that. I mean, I was really close. I think once I once I started getting ye wait, was it then? At one point, I was yelling at someone else to strip. That was the second. That was after. <laughs> oh, okay. Because then, okay. <laughs> so I definitely was like, my character was uh, a little salty about what happened with the fire brigade. So oh, I would have if somebody, if one of you had like really pushed for it, I would have done it. I would have gone with it. And I guess the follow-up question for the GM is, how quickly would that have ended the campaign? <laughs> well, <laughs> I tried to make it very clear to you that it was not a good idea to fight them by letting you know how many they were and how they were armed. Um, you, you did. You did a good job of that. <laughs> uh, essentially, you probably would have needed to... You would have taken damage and you would have had to run if you had any chance of surviving that. It it could have it could have been a very interesting campaign because you all could have died and I would have just had your ghosts doing stuff then and I'm not sure what would have happened there. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, and, and so that encounter again was one that I basically drew directly from the novel. Um, it, in the novel it's fewer people giving the demand because it's only one character who receives the demand to strip um but yeah i it, it's one that really sticks out in the book for me and so i decided to include it here and i was like we'll see what they do i'm not sure how i would have reacted had you all decided to become combative <laughs> definitely combat would have ensued 
how far I, those I, characters were willing to push it of whether they were going to kill you for it uh, and what your reactions were we would have had to explore but i'm almost sad we didn't get to hear elena's thoughts on tenure being <laughs> affected by being an incorporeal being <laughs> I, how would that even change the process right i mean <laughs> lots of questions around this Th that, that would have for made for a very different <laughs> session if i if you all had gotten into a big battle at the beginning and died So what was the fire brigade? It's from the book, right? Yep. You were saying it's just one of the, one of the small, uh, kind of like, governmentally type groups, mm -hmm. gangs essentially. It's uh, the entire world has devolved into local gangs that control certain amounts of territory, mm -hmm. and they just happen to be the one that controlled the area in Central Cerro City. Um, where I started you all. Oh. So, was us becoming part of the fire brigade part of the plan, or...? It was, but I was prepared for you not to accept and not to put on, like, the green sashes, and, um, <laughs> like, if, if you had not done that, I it would have had to adapt a few things, mainly Bine's letter, uh, that he gives you to let you pass or to help you pass through the checkpoints on the raised highway, um, which the text of that I pulled directly from the book uh, and just added in your characters' names. Um, it, I would have had to modify that a little bit, but uh, the green sashes... Essentially, the cannibals would have been more aggressive towards you if you hadn't been wearing them. <laughs> oh, more aggressive then. All right. <laughs> I mean, once they found out you were university, uh, they were they were going to try and eat you. But um, if you hadn't had the green sashes, they probably would have attacked immediately. <laughs> mm. Yikes! Well, that's a little bit. <laughs> 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 Just a wee bit until someone. Wait, I remember who shot first, or was like dragging into the house. Lena was there for the IRB. Someone was. Yeah, I don't remember. I think Sean shot. I think I shot first, and that sort of made everything go pear shaped, and ended up with the bulldozer and the fire. Yeah, I was. <laughs> but, yeah, and then there was a moment where I think you all were still talking, and like I. Or no, you shot, and then I said, run? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, in the bush. I messed it up by talking. Oh, that's right. You yelled <laughs> run and then gave the GM ammo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I generally don't um, care about things like ammunition, but this was a post-apocalyptic survival yeah. situation yeah. where um, those of you who had weapons, uh, when we were doing character creation... Um, I asked you all, or told you all, that you would have to keep track of your bullets. Um, and you didn't really use your bullets too much. The main reason to keep track of them was they were currency. I think it worked really well. I mean, normally when someone says, oh, track your ammo, it's kind of a oh no. Um, <laughs> but it worked out really well, and it made me consider actions a little more. Like, okay, how bad does this have to get? Okay. Layla's about five feet from the door. All right, fine. I guess I'll spend a dollar to save the professor. <laughs> well, and I, I'm not even sure at that point if you knew that they were currency because I didn't give you that information. I just told you to track your ammo. That's true. We didn't know that, but it, but knowing that we were tracking it kind of inferred a certain <laughs> level of value. And you know, post-apocalyptic, we can make the assumption that uh, not going to be ammo caches every time we make camp. Yeah. And I'm sorry to keep running With off. With what you um, know now. <laughs> No worries, we're we're all living just yep. as we. You can, can probably see so, uh, my kid once you know. in a while sprinting by. <laughs> um, keep hearing crashes. Yeah, I'm surprised <laughs> that I'm not actively being stabbed in the side by a dog who wants to eat food three minutes ago. So, <laughs> you know, it's. Now that you it is that what it is. Yeah, I just heard him sigh very loudly. <laughs> very dramatic. Um, <laughs> But now that you kind of in retrospect, 
are there ways that you addressed the conflicts that you encountered that you resolved the story that you would do differently now having all of the information uh probably wouldn't have burned down the bulldozer <laughs> in retrospect although That's key. to be fair like how far would that bulldozer have gotten us got to that one fall my, my only regret is that we didn't have good enough roles to make my Mad Maxian eighteen wheeler with like you know VW bugs stuck on the front at snow plows. I that made me sad. That was my one regret. <laughs> Felt very uh, chaotic. <laughs> the the chainsaw Vespas were a good compromise, though. <laughs> I, I I do appreciate that you came up with with the chainsaw. Oh Vespas. yeah, I am really glad that I was like, what is in this garage? What kind of tools are in the chainsaw? I was like. All I need. <laughs> that was that was all like that was new. Um, I think that was a player intrusion that one of you spent XP for a player intrusion to say that you knew somebody that lived in the neighborhood, and so I came up with that character mm -hmm. on the spot. And the fact that there was a house that you could go take refuge in, and there were tools in the garage, and all of that was just seat of the pants stuff. Oh yeah, that was Lena because uh, yeah. Because she knew, like, a, a, another professor didn't like their research, but knew that they hit, like, a rock. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. yeah, the intrusions are really... I think, honestly, that might be one of the most unique features of the Cypher system to me. Like, that really added some cool elements. And the times that those were used by players of the GM, it really added to the storyline. Yeah. And there are mechanics like that in, in various systems. Um, d and actually even has a similar mechanic that oh. is an optional rule in the in the GM's guide. Um, like, it's like fate points or something like that, where, uh, oh, yeah. and, and kind of what they can be used for. Um, but in Cypher, it's kind of, it's built in, and it's, um, the, if the GM does an intrusion, you all earn experience points, uh, but you don't have to accept the intrusion if you're like, no, I really, w I'm at the at this moment, I need this to happen exactly the way it is without any consequence. You can refuse, and then you don't get the XP. Um, but the player intrusion that just let you slightly alter the narrative and push it in one direction or another, um, it just gives you that additional way to move things where you want them to go and give yourself resources like that. Yeah. It's an interesting component of agency in a role-playing game whereas it's usually so much of that is decided by fate or your game master. It's not usually something that you get to have that much agency in. So that was Well, really and cool. so I, I was going to have you all show up in this neighborhood and like I was prepared for you to just start, you know, knocking on doors or banging down doors or just drive on through the neighborhood and ignore it or whatever. Um, but it was, it was your idea to be like, Oh, I know somebody that lived here. And, and then <laughs> rather than having you just come up with that whole cloth, the, the system is in place to give you the tools to make it so that yes, absolutely, you have the authority to make this decision, you can add this element to the story, and then we all shift and follow that. Uh, so, rather than the chaos of having multiple storytellers that can just throw things in whenever they want, you still have the guide of the GM, but then you have this pool of resources where you can say, I'm going to spend this, and because I spend this, this is true. I'm interested to see what other kinds of stories folks might choose to use Cypher for in the future, definitely. Because it's, I don't know, it's a it's a cool way to do this collaborative storytelling thing. So. I think it worked really well because I feel like in the strangest way, I was just explaining that I felt like I knew what I needed to roll prior to it, and I could like fluctuate that like a little bit and uh, tinker with my pool and that. 
um, which I think there's always that element within like D and D where you roll and you're like, I roll uh, to hit and it's a twenty one and it's like that didn't hit and then everybody like, crap, which is a different kind of thing. So I kind of liked, in a way, kind of knowing as a player what was going to necessarily happen. There were a yeah, couple of times where I gave you impossible rolls. Oh yeah. Like technically impossible rolls by giving you a target number that was above 21 to roll on a 20 sided die. Um, and then you were successful in doing uh, most of those, if I remember correctly, because the system allows for that. But mm-hmm. it really was like, yeah, you need to convince so and so, and they are absolutely not open to being convinced. Uh, so I said it as impossible, but then you figure out how to do it, and then it's up to me to narrate how it happens. I was actually surprised this, like, multiple abilities, or if I first go ahead and do something. There isn't really... There's a limit on that. There is a limit? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. You know, what, what you two just said, Kayla and Malika, you know, it's, it, I hadn't thought of it that way, but it, it is sort of a system that gives a, an enormous amount of agency back to the players in that regard. I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, but it kind of makes me like the system even more. And I could see it. I can see why you chose it for this, Anthony, and why, like, if I ever had the opportunity to do something like this with friends, or okay, we're going to go into a book and we're going to adventure this, I'd probably use Cipher because that flexibility and agency back to the players. Yeah, I can. I can imagine a lot of applications. So, yeah. I'm just thinking through the books on my shelf behind me, going, what? horrible things could I put some friends through well and if you wanted to run a game on the Virginia Tech University Libraries channel um, we would be open to such a thing I I will keep Um, it in mind I've never DM'd I do have a bunch of modules I bought years and years ago where all the players are uh, like dogs or cats of some kind Um, came with a whole so I may have to look into that and get back to (laughs) y'all That it was great. fantastic little like models. Um, I think the paladin was a husky. Our show is specifically designed to allow and support people who are uh, jamming for the first time. So if you are at all interested in doing it, we have people who can assist you and make sure that you're able to do it and that you're comfortable. Um, we can help with uh, fielding questions from the players uh, if you need help and support with that, with designing the the one shot how that works rules what whatever support you might need in order to to gm a game and i'm not talking specifically to you sean but to anybody right. not just uh, you, sean. there's information in the <laughs> chat about how you can become involved in um role of play and take part whether you want to play as a player and you've never played before whether you want to run a game and you've never run a game before um I, this was the third session i've ever run uh, this one and the second session I ever ran were both on this stream. So that's great. Uh, I am a very inexperienced GM, and I have successfully run two games for this channel. And so, don't let having not done it before um, keep you from doing it. We're here to support you. That's great. Although to that to that end, I have a slightly uh, scary question. Have you ever tried sure. to deal with the April Fool classes? I don't know that no. I'm familiar with them. I don't know what those they're, are. They're completely, tell us, tell us. They're completely non constant They ones like, that are called like the Bud Night Light. Uh, the, Bud, the Bud Light Night. There we go. <laughs> and it's just like long completely <laughs> after that. Some of them are literally like, it's literally just called a bear. It's literally a bear. And then it has like stats and things for it. Um, the okay. only one I've ever played was a, um, I played a vampire, but his class was dad. So he came with a fanny pack of holding and a Hawaiian shirt. And it was basically a bard. But he would also, at some point, get to decide like what grand, like what old man he was going to be. If he was going to be a granddad, or if he was a the old man, like candy that he would suck at me. Um, so. Amazing. <laughs> and and uh, um, that's great. BTL Studios is is calling out Monty Hall. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Which we've done um, in our D and D group. We've we've done at least one Monty Hall campaign together. Or, campaign one monty hall session where 
we were all told to prepare our characters from level 1 to level 20, and we leveled all 20 levels throughout the course of one session. Um, How long was the session? Standard length, like three or four hours. Goodness. Yeah, four hours maybe. And so I played a pixie barbarian. Um, oh, she was great. <laughs> So great. Just it's an amazing mental image. Tiny little pixie, <laughs> giant sword. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. The sword wasn't sized to the pixie? And so the pixie's magic did shrink the sword down, but I could just grab a regular, like, giant sword and it became sized for me, amazing. but still hit with the same damage. And so this tiny little pixie, um, and everybody else was like monster classes. I don't remember. Um, mm -hmm. I was a yeah, quaddle. a flying snake. A, a flying <laughs> serpent. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. It could be really fun. Um, we've discussed <laughs> having uh, having a Monty Hall style session as uh, as a role of play. Uh, if viewers are interested in that, let us know in the in the chat. Um, we did have a baby Tarask and also a demi lich <laughs> in that party. So. Amazing. Um, it was it was really great stuff. Uh, if I remember right, the baby Tarask was a bard. Um, so, you know, take take that as you will. You know, a good here. time. Honestly, with the right <laughs> with the right work of literature, you could do something like that on this on this channel. Um, ooh, like Piers Anthony's uh, Xanth series would probably be good for a Monty Hall campaign. It is basically a book no, series no. that is. Mm pun after pun after pun although there is puns are quite well slight in a, a slight obsession in that book series with ladies underpants but um <laughs> otherwise yeah. it, it, it's it's a good series quite humorous potentially some adaptation needed um but if you viewers have suggestions for works of literature that you would like to see us uh, draw from as we design new one shots for role of play please do let us know at roleofplay-g at bt.edu or by going to the bit.ly address bit.ly role of play with the r and the p capital the link is also in chat and let's see here i think at that maybe let's cast our minds forward um are there other works of literature that you can imagine uh, if someone is intrigued by nightfall obviously they should read nightfall i am now like i think i'm gonna have to read nightfall uh what other pieces of literature or media do you think would give a similar experience to this session i don't know I I always recommend the Broken Earth Trilogy for anybody who's interested in this kind of thing because it, it straddles an interesting line between fantasy and science fiction. And mm. it's some of the finest literature I've read in, in the past years. Um, that's by N.K. Jemisin. And she also did one that... It's the start of a trilogy, from what I understand, um, called The City We Became, which is also really quite, quite mm. incredible. Um, where people become basically the embodiment of a city, and the city wakes up. And there's all kinds of interesting concepts in there. Hmm. Interesting. I was mentioning before, but I feel like it uh, left hand, hmm. especially for ciphers. Like both would work. I feel so bad because like this this type of science fiction isn't the type that I normally delve into <laughs> so I don't know if I have any um good recommendations um yeah I'm just thinking about all the movies that have come out recently about space um I'm trying to remember the name a book And it's not coming to me. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, 
for me as far as like the philosophical aspects and the the way that it makes me think about societal forces and things like that i am i would say kim stanley robinson's mars trilogy um honestly uh, basically any kim stanley robinson novels um they they're all really good um there was another one that I was trying to think of, and I just cannot remember what it's called right now, um, that is a science fiction work where people discover the ability to basically step from our reality to the next one over. And uh, so they travel to different worlds, but they're still technically on Earth. They just keep shifting from one reality to the next, to the next, to the next. And it's a big long um series of multiple earths um and i wish i mm. could remember what it's called uh i will look and maybe have a name for you shortly yeah anthony uh, just from what you were saying made me rem reminded me of one i haven't read in a long time it was a hugo winner called um spin i think it was called and in that all the mm. stars go out I kind of wonder if there was a nightfall connection there, and there was. It doesn't have the same kind of societal impact and and massive adjustments that we see in Nightfall, um, but it does kind of vaguely remind me of that. It's been like ten years, so I cannot. I literally cannot remember what happens. I need to read it again. Apparently, it is um, the Long Earth by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. Ah, oh, Terry Pratchett. Okay. Mm. <laughs> I mean, that, that sells me on it. <laughs> um, and just sort of the the implications of this major discovery that alters the world. Um, so that seems to have some similar elements to it as well. We do have one recommendation also from Jonathan via the chat. Uh, All You Zombies by Robert Heinlein. Uh, different plot but has a lot of that philosophical discussion, I think is what that means. Uh, one of his favorite stories of all time. Uh, so, a lot of, there's so much good sci-fi out there. Um, so, yeah, awesome. Let's see, continuing to look forward, we are at, well, we are near the end of our semester. Um, so we, we do only have one session left for role of play for this semester. Um, and that uh, would be the session that we're most excited about, I guess, in general, because it is the only one that's confirmed. Uh, so next Friday on role of play, we'll be playing uh, a second part to our Sherlock Holmes um, session that we had, was that uh, three weeks ago now, I believe, something like that. No, more than that. Five weeks ago? Something like that. Um, we will have some returning folks from the first session and some new folks, uh, and they are looking uh, for artifacts. It is being called The Adventure of the Artifacts, part two, by uh, VTU Akira, who will be your game master for that game, uh, dear channel. Um, and we do, there's also a plug in the chat for our uh, science fiction collection in Special <coughs> Collections and University Archives. It has been featured uh, in some parts on Archival Adventures. Very, very early on. A smidge. <laughs> yeah. That was my very first episode of Archival Adventures. Yeah. This is a great one. There's some gorgeous artwork. Sadly, we uh, don't among... have the September 1941 Astounding Stories. But the full text of the short story from that is available on the internet. Yeah. So if folks out there have interests uh, in other aspects of our special collections um, that they would want highlighted potentially on Archival Adventures, you can reach out with those suggestions and uh, you can see Anthony talk about all kinds of cool stuff that we have in uh, mostly in our basement in our library. Well, not technically no. the basement, the yeah. first floor. Uh, su slightly subterranean. Um, 
but there's a lot of cool stuff in there. Um, are there, since we've only got one session coming up, um, it's not very exciting to ask you what you're most excited about, uh, but are there pieces of literature that uh, y'all can think about um, that are uh, just poised to become one shots? Anything that you are just, you would just love to see. A red wall adventure would be hilarious. I don't know how many people are actually familiar with, with that. It's a children's series from the from the nineties. Or, or Don Quixote, as we mentioned, uh, and before we started. <laughs> yeah. I personally really enjoyed watching uh, the. <laughs> Thank you. That was, oh, that was so funny. I'm like. I'm so not prepared for this question. I'm so sorry. I'm like looking at my bookshelf. I'm like, what do I got back there that I really love? I don't know. My favorite book of all time is The Handmaid's Tale, um, which I think could be a really good one shot. Obviously, the new season just came out, so it's also at the forefront of my mind. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that would be really interesting. That's a. I'm really into dystopian science fiction, so um, that's. That's kind of what I lean towards. I mean, um, the first game that I ran on the channel was um, John Brenner's The Sheep Look Up. Uh, and uh, yeah. the second one was Nightfall, which is also post-apocalyptic. So, yeah. Um, yeah. There are a couple of things that I can think of. Uh, something like Nancy Drew or The Hardy Boys <sighs> would be good. Yes. Um, I, I personally really like... Um, like disaster movies and disaster fiction so like uh a novel like blizzard or um uh, ones where like it's the coming of a new ice age that suddenly descends upon mankind and you suddenly you're you're in a situation where you have to survive so uh things like that that i may try to do uh something with in the future and then of course i'm going to bring back um <clears throat> Elizabeth Moon's Vadas War series and actually do that Lasers and Feelings one shot that was planned and had to be canceled. Uh, so sometime, probably next year, I will we will have a very zany um, space opera adventure. Yeah. Yeah, we are discussing options for the summer. Potentially a multi-part, all-connected series of things. Who knows? There are ideas floating around. Uh, like many folks in uh, in universities, to a certain extent, we're just trying to get through final exams. So uh, <laughs> we we will uh, have that Sherlock Holmes inspired adventure next week, and we'll be confirming more things for the summer. We do have something already tentatively on the schedule for the fall: uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, themed uh, Dadland based uh, adventure. So that I'm thoroughly looking forward to. Um, I'll have my towel. I'll be there. Whether I'm playing or watching, I'll be there and I'll be ready. Um, but we are we're always excited to hear what folks are interested in. And uh, of course, we thank our guests for, for being here and for sharing your thoughts. And if you have more suggestions later, you can always uh, come and pop them in our chat, or you can tweet them at us with the hashtag VTUL role of play. Um, and we will keep an eye on that for suggestions as well. All right, let's see, I think we're, any final questions? For, for each other for our game master. For inviting really fun time. <laughs> yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, we are thank you so much, Anthony, for, for running this session. Um, and thank you all for being here. It uh, it was an absolute delight to watch. Uh, and I really appreciate your time this afternoon uh, chatting about it. Um, 
If folks have suggestions or questions about the channel or about our games, you can reach out at rollofplay g at vt.edu. Uh, and as I said, we will be back here uh, next Wednesday for Archival Adventures. And then on Friday of next week for our Role of Play One Shot Part 2 uh, with our Sherlock inspired, what are we calling it? I've already lost it in the chat. Mm, uh, nope, it's gone. Adventure, adventure of the Artifacts. Yes. Adventure of the Part Artifacts two. Part 2. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yep, yeah. Archival Adventures. Are we raiding Archival anyone? Adventures next week is um, Hokey Pride Records. Uh, and then the week after that, we will be looking at Watercolors of Fungi. So. Oh. Excellent. All right. We will be raiding um, NCSU. Uh oh. Are we allowed to do that? Is that in our contract? <laughs> <laughs> I think the IRB will allow it. <laughs> But thank you. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And thank you, everyone, for being here. <laughs>